Uh, thank you for the introduction. And first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for having uh, this wonderful conference. Actually, it's for me, uh, it's the first time to visit Israel, and I'm enjoying very much uh, of this place. I mean, food, and what nice weather, and the people, and then uh, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'm experimentalist working on uh, cold atomic gases, and especially I'm uh, interested in uh, far equilibrium uh, dynamics, especially superfluid systems. So in this uh, presentation, I want to talk about uh, two or three experiments which I've done for the last several years, uh, which is about that, uh, uh, some kind of uh, superfluid dynamics and then which I captured as a turbulence in atomic superfluid gases. I hope I can enjoy, uh, entertain you in the, the following 40 minutes. Okay, this is the outline. Uh, first, I will talk about uh, general introductions, uh, to, uh, turbulence, and uh, especially comparison between the classical turbulence and the superfluid turbulence. And then I will talk about uh, two or three experiments uh, which I have done, uh, or my group has done. First one is uh, observation about von Karaman vortex strip. Uh, it is well known in the classical uh, viscous fluid, but it also occur in the superfluid systems. And then I'll talk about the superfluid phase change in dynamics, which I will talk about superfluid vortex formation, uh, so-called the Kibo-Durang mechanism stuff and universality about that, yeah. And then I will talk about the spin turbulence. Actually, atomic cloud can have the spin degree of freedom. So there's a very interesting uh, setting uh, where the superfluidity meets uh, the magnetism. So in that setting, uh, we can also talk about the uh, turbulence system. So I hope uh, uh, and then I can finish up here. <laughs> And then I'll give the summary in the outlook. Okay, turbulence is basically irregular chaotic flow state. So it's very complicated. So sometimes uh, it's so complicated it's out of our understanding. But uh, for me, I mean, when I look at turbulence, uh, it looks very natural. And also sometimes it looks uh, beautiful. All right here is uh, this one and the cloud and the nebula in the universe. I will attempt it to understand it, right? and want to describe it uh, what in, with, with whatever language you have. I mean, we want to describe it, right? So it's uh, very intriguing and the fundamentally important issues. And also it's practically very important because uh, turbulence is uh, deeply related with that uh, energy dissipation. So whenever you uh, think about the aerodynamic design and hydrodynamic design, you have to th think about the uh, turbulence, which occur with the high Reynolds numbers there. Uh, so it's, uh, basically in classical fluids, uh, turbulence uh, might be described by this nebulous stochication. I mean, we know there's a uh, kind of a classical description for that. So nonlinear uh, partial differential equations, but it's very difficult, we know. Uh, the existence of a solution and also its uniqueness of solution has, has not been proved yet. So it is uh, one of the millennium problems in, uh, as presented as like that uh, in the beginning of this uh, century. So also as many physicists try to uh, to understand this uh, turbulence phenomena, but it's not uh, completed yet. Uh, and also, as uh, Feynman has pointed out, it's very, very difficult, but it is very important. As also Onsager has uh, tried to figure it out how to understand it, but it's, uh, uh, still, we don't have a complete understanding about turbulence. Nevertheless, I mean, over the many years, uh, using the experimental studies and then also numerical studies, uh, there is a couple of lessons which is well established in the classical uh, turbulence uh, studies. One of the uh, notion, is, which is well established in our understanding, is about laminar to turbulent transition, right? So it's a classical fluid that definitely is well characterized by the so-called dimensionless parameter Reynolds numbers. So for small Reynolds numbers, uh, you would have very nice streamline as a laminar flow. But once you have a large Reynolds numbers, then you would have a turbulence. That is a well established. So it's random with nothing but the, this ratio, the kinetic energy divided by the, the viscous energy. So once you, that the inertia uh, tendency is much larger than the, the frictions, then you would have a turbulence, right? The second notion is about, uh, uh, we have about the classical turbulence is energy cascade. So basically uh, can be kept uh, described in these pictures. So once you put the energy, inject energy into the systems, then system would uh, dissipate uh, the energy into the high, high wave numbers. 
So it's uh, from the low wave numbers and to the high wave numbers, the so energy is pro uh, propagating uh, without loss, it kind of energy conservation, and then eventually very, very short wavelength and high wave number regions, it would be dissipated as heat. So that is uh, basically what we have about the classical turbulences. And then this is, uh, yeah, some pictures. And also there is a wonderful uh, mathematical description about uh, this uh, energy cascading. Uh, this is uh, uh, named as a chromograph scaling, has a special uh, exponent in the, this power law uh, in the uh, spectrum in, the, in, the, in terms of wave numbers here. So there's uh, the key features of the classical turbulence systems. Okay, now I want to move to the superfluid system. Clearly, it is a superfluid, which has a zero viscosity. So what does it mean? I mean, if we think about the Raynaud numbers, then this means it's the uh, infinite Raynaud numbers. So we know that once you have high Raynaud numbers, it would become turbulent, right? What does it mean? Then superfluid would be immediately turbulent in your system, but it is a superfluid, right? So it can, it should be, flowing without friction, right? So it's a very uh, kind of, a, it's a classical notion cannot apply to the superfluid system, definitely. So there is a interesting systems uh, and where we can extend our understanding or extend our understanding about superfluid system. Uh, not only having the zero viscosity, which is a very bizarre and very uh, exotic uh, property, uh, the superfluid have also quantized the vorticity. As we all know that uh, this order parameter has uh, uh, this type of uh, wave function type. So U1 symmetry is broken. And then definitely uh, according to quantum uh, mechanics, uh, the angular momentum got quantized. And then this system, the circulation uh, is uh, quantized in this system. So uh, it's different from the classical uh, fluid system. Also, it has uh, two fluid characters. Uh, superfluid coexists with uh, uh, thermal fractions, a thermal component, which is not condensed into superfluid parts. So definitely when you try to describe the turbulent or fluid di uh, dynamics in the superfluid system, uh, it would show the two fluid character. And then between the superfluid part and the non-condensed, non-superfluid part would have some kind of mutual interactions and uh, some kind of frictions. To, so it's a very complicated system, right? But a new system and an exciting system but the key question is uh, how, you, how we have to characterize the superfluid turbulent state and their evolutions. So, uh, and also I want to point that uh, this turbulence uh, problem is, uh, can be uh, considered as a nice problem for the far from equilibrium quantum dynamics. I mean, these days modern physics try to understand about uh, non-equilibrium dynamics in here and there and try to extend our scope from the very nice ground state uh, understanding to some excited state and they're far from equilibrium state and also think about some kind of a universe scaling behavior in the uh, strongly driven system, quantum chips and so on. So turbulence is presented, can be presented as one of the nice uh, experiment, uh, topic for that field. And also uh, I talk about the classical turbulence in the beginning. So uh, maybe there might be some kind of universality, universality of the turbulence. So we might, combined our uh, phenomenological understanding about the classical turbulence and the quantum turbulence. So we might have a good understanding about these very interesting problems. Okay, then uh, when you want to study about superfluid turbulence, what system we can think about? I mean, obviously we have these three systems in our hands, right? The solid, liquid, and gas. So, so here is a superconductor. Definitely electrons is moving inside there, superfluid. And uh, liquid helium. And actually liquid helium traditionally has been studied for quantum turbulence. And then people found many decades ago nice uh, similarity between the classical turbulence. In certain regions, they also observed the kind of uh, chromograph scaling law in that the energy cascading behavior. And furthermore, these days they found that some type of different type of quantum turbulence, ultra quantum turbulence, depending on how you generate the turbulence in this system. So it's well established and keep going on in this field. About the superconductor, I mean, this day, uh, in the first talk from Professor Ilhani, we talk about hydrodynamic uh, uh, behavior of electrons of theirs. So definitely, uh, you need a very, very clean system to study about this turbulence in the solid system. So it might be a little bit difficult. <laughs> but here, so I want to talk about the gas system there. So ultra-cold atomic gas is uh, 
the clearly, I mean, uh, you can prepare the very, very small sample in your vacuum chamber uh, using the laser cooling and the evaporation cooling. And so you can make a very tiny uh, gas sample in your chambers. And of course, I mean, uh, it's a very dilute system. So in terms of Fermi temperature, it's about the micro Kelvin. So it's uh, extremely dilute. But uh, here, uh, I don't have a time to explain it, uh, explain the detail, uh, but it's uh, so-called laser cooling and evaporation cooling. We can go down to the uh, nano Kelvin region. So definitely the T over TF is very low. So definitely we can talk about the quantum degeneracy and the correlations phenomena here. And then we call it quantum gases. Over there, um, this is kind of a represented pictures of our communities. Boson condensation occurs, and then here's mirror wave interface pattern between the two independent BCs. So it's a superfluid system. Okay, so this atomic gas is presenting a new setting uh, where we can study about the quantum uh, uh, superfluid turbulence there. So in comparison with the uh, uh, liquid helium system, it shows that a uh, little bit different uh, lengths hierarchy in terms of uh, system size and the vortex core size and so on. So it's a, uh, and also uh, especially uh, this uh, experiment setup, uh, uh, we can tune that many experimental parameters very nicely. Uh, if you squeeze the one direction, you can think about the, the 2D dynamics. And if you uh, also, you can, uh, tune that the interaction parameter between the atoms, then you can talk, think about the strongly interacting system. And also, you change that the bosonic atom with the fermionic atoms, then, then you can also handle with that uh, BCS type superfluid in the system. So it's a very versatile platform. So over the last the decades, uh, and then over 20 decades, and people talk about uh, using this atomic gas system for studying that uh, superfluid turbulence. This is, uh, uh, turbulence generation demonstrated also as by squeezing the one direction, people study about the 2D quantum turbulences, and then also uh, nicely gently uh, rocking your system, people uh, measured, observed a turbulent cascade, a kind of energy cascading behavior in the power law behavior uh, reported by the Cambridge group there. And also, also <coughs> we allow that the spin degree of freedom in this system and then uh, talking about the spin turbulences in this system. So uh, this is a setup, a schematic diagram for our experimental setup. So uh, it's pretty much straightforward. First, uh, you need to prepare that the atomic superfluid gas and then generate turbulence in your system in, with many methods and depending on the, what type of uh, situation you want to study and then proving the turbulent states. So in our experiment, we especially are interested in the quasi-2D geometry, because in this case, it is easier to uh, probe that the flow patterns of there is a good uh, dimensions uh, for imaging, and also a uh, good dimension for studying that the interesting physics at 2D. <coughs> and then uh, uh, we can prepare the bosonic superfluid, also the fermionic superfluid. And how to generate turbulence? Uh, it's pretty much straightforward. Uh, using the external perturbation, using the laser beams or the magnetic field gradient, it was just a sh uh, uh, what is it? Uh, shaking the cloud or poking the laser beam and uh, storing it with uh, mechanically external perturbations. Don't you heat up? I'm sorry. Don't you heat up the atoms when you make them? Heat yes. Up? So we should be very gentle. Yes. <laughs> And then the, we can measure that the turbulent flow by directly measuring that the flow patterns or uh, measuring the vortex positions like a uh, squid <laughs> there. But of, of course, because it's one shot, not scanning, it's just the one shot as to measure the density profile of your superfluid clouds. So by looking at that uh, turbulent flow as function of times, we can study the relaxation. And then by analyzing this uh, density profile evolutions, we can talk about uh, energy distributions and cascading and sort of uh, many aspects of uh, turbulent dynamics is there. Okay, so and in, the, in the remaining time, I want to talk about the three, uh, if possible, I want to talk about three experiments which we've done. Uh, first is about the von Karaman vortex field observations in the superfluid gases. Okay, so this is the, uh, 
transitions of classical fluid from that laminar flow and turbulent flow when you crank up your flow speed. Here is the flow, the fluid is passing by the cylindrical object here. So here, but interesting part is a precursor uh, to that the turbulence generation is that this so-called von Karman vortex street. Here, a uh, very large range of uh, wavelength number from 50 to 10 to five you would see this type of alternating vortex uh, shedding phenomena in system. So it's classically well described and then this universality is, uh, is confirmed in the classical viscose fluid. The interesting question is, uh, can you see this type of uh, transitions, uh, laminar to turbulent transition, or can we observe the von Karman vortex type uh, excitation in the superfluid? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> and then, uh, we did the uh, experiment like this. Prepare the pancake-like shape atomic cloud. Here is the roughly a kind of 200 micrometer diameter or something like that. And we laser, uh, we shine the laser beam. And then from here to there, we just uh, linearly sweep the laser beam positions. And then here, we just control the movement of the laser beam, or kind of control the velocity. So obviously, if you uh, slowly sweep it, then if it is uh, below critical velocity, uh, nothing would happen it, because it is superfluid. But once you increase uh, the moving velocity above a critical velocity, then you would uh, initiate. You would start uh, making uh, vortices uh, in your system. Here is the critical velocity is about uh, five point on the speed of sound. And the critical velocity is 1.1 millimeter per second. It's very, very slow because it's a very, very dilute system. But once it is above the critical velocity, you would start uh, making a vortices. And then when you crank up that uh, obstacle velocity, you would make this kind of a large clusters that's coming out and sh uh, shed from the, the moving obstacle. So definitely we observe that uh, uh, some vortex cluster uh, is uh, emitted by the, the moving obstacle, like uh, uh, we observed in the classical fluid. And also, in the very small velocity regions, we observe this type of regular, very nice uh, kind of alternating vortex shedding in this uh, uh, field. Here is uh, a numerical simulation. Here is the, this blob, is a black blob, is consisting of uh, two quantum vortices with the same sign. So it's a shed from left side and right side alternate manner of there. So out of this measurement, we have these pictures about that the superfluid vortex shedding. Uh, below critical velocity, nothing happened, but just above the critical velocity, uh, vortex uh, start being shed, but there is some kind of certain velocity ranges where that the regular shedding, like uh, this von Karman. And also high velocity, you have a large cluster is coming out, and eventually it's the turbulent is generated. It's pretty much, pretty much similar to what we have in the classical fluid. The furthermore, <coughs> in classical uh, studies, fluid studies, People study about that, that this, uh, the ratio of uh, obstacle diameter divided by that, uh, this uh, uh, vortex street uh, spacing. Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, over the large uh, Reynolds number ranges, uh, this value, so-called named that the Strahol number, is a very, very constant, like 0.2 in the classical viscous fluid. But also we studied about the, that value, that dimensionless uh, numbers in our system, and then we found that it is also very close to 0.2. So uh, this, uh, I think, is a very suggesting that uh, there might be some kind of a universal behavior of uh, struggle number for the superfluid. And also, is a related theoretical proposal is down there. They propose a new type of a superfluid Reynolds number to uh, explain this kind of a dynamic similarity of uh, vortex shedding dynamics. Okay, and then I want to finish this part by showing these uh, images. So this is a cloud uh, pattern. This is the Korean Peninsula, it's Jeju Island, here's Typhoon I, and then the wind is blowing this way, and then after this obstacle, you can see the nice uh, vortex, von Karema vortex street. But here is uh, our sample, it's very, very small. So fundamentally, they have a totally different nature, but it's, uh, in terms of vortex shedding, they show the very similar images. So it's, uh, Nice cross classical quantum correspondence. Uh, well, correspond I don't know. It's very impressive, I think. Okay, then I want to move to the second experiment. Uh, and then time is... Uh, okay. 
So which is about the phase transition dynamics, uh, superfluid phase transition dynamics. Actually, when you cool your sample, I mean, we've also heard about the cooling down the superconductors in the, in the morning sessions and where we observe the vortices. Mm. So that is uh, actually is partially is uh, shared with this part. Okay, so we have a Bose gas and then we just cool it down. Then obviously we know is uh, 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 to make a superfluid phase transition involving the spontaneous symmetry breaking over there, like here. It's a, a metal wave interference pattern over there. But once you have a system, which have a large spatial extent, then whole system is across the critical temperature, but this part and that part is uh, causally independent, right? So each part would undergo the phase transition, definitely then the, you would have a randomly different superfluid phase here and there. And then first, I mean, especially independent regions, and then you would end up some kind of a domain, special domains with a different superfluid phases. And then once that uh, order parameter is uh, well developed after this period, you would end up with kind of a defect in your system because uh, in the interface between the uh, multiple domains, special domain with different superfluid phases, inter interface you would form up that kind of uh, quantum vortices there. There's a possibility, right? So this is so-called spontaneous defect formation. Uh, this is kind of a very universal phenomenon whenever you deal with kind of uh, symmetry breaking uh, phase transitions in your system. So, and also I want to point that this is a very interesting non-equilibrium dynamics involving the order parameter growth and defect formation and relaxing and also a thermalization issue. So once we have a better understanding about uh, this critical phase transition dynamics, then definitely would be helpful for us to have a better understanding about the uh, quantum dynamics and so on. And especially I want to talk about the defect numbers uh, and then as a function of uh, uh, that one. So by the, by the way, the spontaneous defect formation is well uh, presented by, actually it's proposed by that, uh, this uh, Thomas Gibble uh, many years ago, many decades ago in the context of uh, cosmology. And, and then he th thought about uh, why we have inhomogeneity in the universe and so on. And then later that that concept is kind of developed by that uh, uh, Jurek uh, uh, to that the condensed matter system. And he proposed that the superfluid helium would uh, allow that the tabletop experiment about this spontaneous uh, defect formation uh, proposed by Thomas Gibble there. And then uh, I don't have time to explain this the theory in there, but uh, punchline is that the, the defect number, uh, defect density is going to be governed by this power law right here. here. So it's, uh, uh, there's uh, the uh, final conclusion about keyboard Jura mechanism is this, density defect is uh, governed by this power law. Here's the TQ is kind of a quench weight, uh, inverse of a quench weight, quench time. And then, then the power exponent is given by this way. Here's a new and Z is kind of critical exponent of your phase transitions over there. So it is, uh, uh, they ended up this kind of prediction based on the equilibrium property of your system here, a critical uh, point. And then the beautiful part of this uh, uh, prediction is, uh, is very, very universal. So once the system is belong to the same universal class, then uh, this kind of power law behavior is go governed by that class which is uh, characterized by the exponent over there. So, so what I want to is like, what is big D? Uh, sorry, D? Uh, I'm sorry. The big D, D. is the uh, dimension of a system, and small d is the, the defect uh, of your interest, dimension of a defect of your interest. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, they talk about the scaling length you would have right after passing through the critical temperatures. And then, of course, uh, depending on the dimension of your defect, uh, that the defect density can be estimated by uh, using this kind of characteristic length scale after passing through the critical point. So this is what they have over there. Z is uh, uh, the, is that, uh, the critical exponent, uh, dynamic critical exponent of the systems. And then this new and Z is a critical exponent of this uh, phase transitions. Okay, so it's a very beautiful predictions uh, came out and then many experimentalists tried to confirm it and then using the many different uh, systems, uh, liquid crystal, superfluid helium, and trapped ion, a little small version of uh, uh, 
testing. And also, is the atomic gas system has been used to study about this one. And then here, but uh, we also uh, are using our system to test out this uh, uh, interesting uh, physics. Uh, especially, we use that uh, so-called strongly interacting Fermi gases. Uh, this system is very interesting because uh, uh, two component of Fermi system, uh, they were well described, by, or exactly described by this model Hamiltonian. The furthermore, so-called uh, using that so-called flashback readiness, depending on the magnetic field strength one can tune this, the strength of this uh, interaction between the two spin component. So in this system, one can study about so-called BCS, BC crossover. So with the uh, negative scattering length, you can uh, make a BCS type superfluid, and the positive scattering length, you can make a tightly bound molecule, the BC type superfluid over there. So by tuning that uh, interaction strength, one can study the, the formulaic style superfluid and the bosonic style superfluid then our motivation is, okay, the ex scaling exponent is going to be preserved uh, over this kind of uh, crossover region or not. When that uh, microscopic uh, nature of the system is changed for the bosonic and the fermionic and so on. So this is what we have. So basically prepare the sample just above that the critical temperature and we quench down our sample with a given uh, cooling rate and then measure that the defect numbers in the superfluid phases. And in, as a function of interaction strength, is a BC and the BCS type, and uh, as a function of uh, quench rate, is a quench time over there. And this is what we have. And uh, for slow quench rhythms, we have some type of scaling behavior. And then we found that the scaling exponent is pretty much conserved uh, over that, uh, uh, the, this crossover reasons. So it's the demonstrating the universality of a kibbutz rang mechanism there. But we also uh, observed some kind of beyond the kibbutz rang mechanism effect in this system. As you can see here, for fast quench, the short quench time, somehow is a defect number is saturated there. Saturated. Of course, I mean, too fast quench, then maybe during the formation, the defect would be annihilated in the forming of the superfluid order parameter. But uh, what is the real mechanism about that? Uh, we don't know yet. So, but furthermore, uh, it was uh, previously observed in the BEC type experiment before there. And furthermore, we observed that, uh, that uh, this final value, saturated defect number, uh, which we inverted into kind of uh, normalized uh, defect density as a function of uh, coherence length in this each conditions, we found that it is almost constant in this system. So it's kind of hinting like uh, some type of a universal behavior uh, universal dynamics is occur in this for fast quench regions. We figured out it depending on the how you are order parameters growing in your quench system. For slow quench, uh, the order parameter is growing when the system's temperature is uh, ramping down. But for fast quench, because uh, order to for order parameter to grow up, it requires a finite time. But before growing up, that order parameter uh, big enough to the sensible magnitude to embrace that the defect for defect. If that the quench is finished, then all the parameters growing at the fixed temperature over there. So this one would make a big difference. And then to test it out, we imply, apply that the so-called two-step cooling experiment. So uh, here, we control that the cooling rate uh, when the system crossing the critical regions and then after passing the critical region. So it's the first cooling rate is uh, determining how the initial the length scale for defect formation, and then the later cooling rate is governing that the how your order parameter is going up in your system. So by controlling that two quench rate independently, we measure the def defect numbers, and then very interestingly, when we uh, normalize them, uh, we found that uh, Final defect number is uh, independently governed, or, or so the enhancement factor of the defect number is uh, independently governed by this uh, second quench rate. So when we found that the final defect number can be factorized in this manner, so uh, kind of universal function over there. So as one of them is determined by the first quench rate, and then the other the enhancing factor or suppression factor is governed by this. Uh, the second quench rate over there. 
So this universe only coarsening dynamics we observed. And then this is a picture, finally, we have out of this uh, couple of experiments. First, I mean, before uh, phase transition, system would have a lot of thermal fluctuation in your system. And then uh, when you cool the phase transition, uh, below the phase transition, the system would develop some kind of a certain uh, length scale, which would govern that, uh, the following that, uh, the dynamics over there. But during this uh, period, before all the parameters grow up to a sensible magnitude, and before having the well-defined defect in your system, system would have some kind of coarsening dynamics. It's very, com uh, must be a very complicated dynamic, but we found that uh, it sh seems to have some kind of universal dynamics there. And then eventually at a later time, all the parameters are well grown up, and then defect can be stably formed in your system. And then at the very late time, you would have a relaxation in your system by combining or um, pair annihilation, your vortex, and so on. And eventually, it end up with a very well uh, uniform phase of a superfluid. So this is the picture we have right now out of our experiment. And how many times do I have? One, One minute? Well, OK. Make it three. Ah, three, OK. And the spin turbulence, OK. Atom has a spin. But having spin is uh, give us a new spin to this system <laughs> because the spin rotation uh, intimately related with that kind of a superfluid phase. As we talk about the Berry phase, the Berry phase and the rotation, you have a phase. And also, even this spin one part, you have m equals zero component. You, if you flip it, then the wave function will have a minus one sign over there, polarity. So, and also it's a plus minus one component that can I make a zero component of there. So uh, having the spin degree of freedom in superfluid system would open up that the very wide window, wide uh, uh, phenomena we can address. I mean, superfluidity and magnetism, superconductivity is kind of two pillar of the condensed matter system, right? So the spin of uh, boson condensate open up this uh, opportunity. Okay, so we talk about the story about this fast winding. Uh, we study about the polar. Uh, phase in spin one BC. Uh, the ground state manifold will be given like this one. This U1 is from the superfluid phase, S2 is kind of spin rotation, and then this divided by Z2 is uh, that's due to the invariance for this system. This is a polar system, so once you flip it in the opposite direction, then wave function will have a minus one sign. So it is uh, coupled between that the superfluid phase and spin rotations in this manner, so it kind of a degeneracy over there. So due to this kind of uh, uh, structure of uh, system, it would have half quantum vortices and also 2D skirmian and also 3D manner spin monopole. This is analogous to the, two, the Polyakov monopole-like structure there. So having the defects, a new type of a defect, what does it mean? It, it can have a, we can have a new type of a 2D superfluidity. Once you remember about that kind of, uh, uh, what is that, uh, BKT like uh, phase transition is driven by the, the defect formation and then thermal vortices and so on, then uh, we can definitely uh, imagine that uh, we can expect new type of a 2D superfluidity. That is actually my motivation studying about this superfluid system. And then in our experiment, we observe the half quantum vortices. We print the single quantum vortex there, and that is dynamically split into two half quantum vertices. And here's the white and black showing the magnetization, so there's a magnetic core in it, so the two split into two parts. And also we uh, demonstrate spin superfluidity in this system and then by the storing that the uh, laser beam, spin sensitive laser beam and showing that the onset behavior of that the dissipation there. And then here we can study about the quench experiment. I mean, by controlling that this uh, microwave will be driving, that we can uh, tune that the anisotropy of this system. So prepare that the easy axis phase and then changing that uh, spin anisotropy to the easy plane side, then you can study about uh, spontaneous symmetry, symmetry breaking system there. Opposite way can be possible, like uh, prepare the easy plane and then change that uh, this quadratic Gman effect energy, uh, basically changing the spin anisotropy. Dynamic control is possible. So out of this, I mean, we could study like the spin turbulences and then also study about uh, some type of a scaling behavior and the defect formation scaling. And then also opposite, uh, we interesting uh, topological object which is named as a wall vortex composite effect. This is the wall, but terminated by the half quantum vortex there. 
So we just uh, figured out the structures there and confirm it is a wall vortex composite defect in the special quench experiment. Okay, this is a summary slide. I introduced that the turbulence study and the three experiments. And the final method is that uh, superfluid turbulence is a very, very interesting uh, system and is a very controllable. So I, I hope uh, we can handle that the many uh, theoretical concepts. Uh, this has been discussed in the, these days uh, in terms of a far from equilibrium dynamics, uh, kind of a scaling hypothesis, non thermal fixed point, and so on, and thermalization issue. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Yes, questions? Okay. In the first part of your talk, what happens if, what, if you move this laser beam faster mm. than the velocity of sound? Do you create a Cherenko variation or do you create a shock wave? What do you do? What happens? Both is uh, possible, but uh, we, uh, we didn't observe it, but some other group is observing uh, the supersonic behavior. But if you're fast, too fast, if you move that obstacle too fast, then the condensate, I mean, our superfluid gas would ignore uh, that you know, because it's a compressible system, so it does not have enough time to respond to it. Okay. Yes, yeah, I have a question about the uh, spontaneous vortex uh, system, yes. that one you showed us. So in that case, you uh, uh, told us uh, you have a pair annihilation, which means you have a vortex, anti-vortex yes. uh, pair, or something like that, but in your, uh, picture, I don't see the uh, contrast between, I cannot tell the which one is uh, vortex and anti-vortex. That is my first question. And second question is, uh, you said that is the quantum vortex. So what's the uh, quanta, quantum quantity? Something like uh, you have a superconducting minus vortex is uh, H over E, something like that. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, have uh, some kind of quantized quantity in your vortex? Uh, yes, it's, uh, mm -hmm. the reason why it's called quantum is the circulation around the vortex core is uh, quantized by the h bar so over m. h bar over m. Over m? Yeah, circulation is nothing but the integral, line integral, closed line integral over velocity. So m is what? What is m? Uh, atomic uh, particle mass. Oh, I see. OK. Uh, and then the fourth, of course, I mean, in these uh, images, uh, we don't uh, distinguish between the vortex sign. Uh, but uh, uh, there's another method that we can uh, measure that the uh, velocity flow around the vortex core. So using that one, we can assign that the vortex sign. The, here, I don't have uh, experiment data. For example, you showed uh, three vortices. Yes. So if you have a pair annihilation, you have an uh, even number of vortices. Yes. But in your, uh, yeah, in your uh, photograph, you showed us the only uh, even number of vortices. Then then probably the conservation of a vortex and the vortex uh, kinds of some violated. It can be violated spontaneously, yeah. yes. When so you can really your simple, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what makes a violation? Uh, it's a spontaneously broken. So. <laughs> Which means you have some additional uh, interactions come into play. You uh, well, uh, I don't know. I have no idea about the how it's spontaneously broken. What is the uh, behind the scene about the driving that the spontaneous breaking, so on. For yeah. example, the Bina one showed <laughs> us that it's a manic field, uh, yeah. hidden manic But field in terms of the average field. sense, I mean, it's always zero. I mean, if you do that many times, it's different from that what uh, uh, presented it in this way. And also here, as you can see that the here is kind of a clad, a kind of round shape of a vortex core, right? Can you see this here? A little yeah. bit, kind of a, like a smiling point here. That is kind of in the middle of annihilation, mm. plus and the minus one, kind of touch to each that other that and the banding like together. Okay. That looks like a pair, but. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. okay. okay. Other questions? Last part, you talked about the anti spin turbulence, and I was wondering whether I missed it or I, I, you, you probably mentioned that. This bond Karman vortex street, have you reproduced for this spin? Uh, uh, no, no, it's a very interesting question, but uh, I, I didn't try yet, but it must be interesting, yes. Yes. So this uh, could be a very stupid question, but you started from the universe map and you learned something, the lessons from your experiment. Can you give us a lesson from your experiment about the uh, uh, formation of the universe? Uh, formation of the universe. <laughs> Formation universe, okay. 
No, I, I, I don't get to the, that point yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Can you sure. control the number of vortices? Uh, yes, I mean, many, many ways. I mean, depending on that, uh, the speed of your obstacle, moving obstacle, or uh, depend, uh, control at the quench rate, uh, we can control at the mean number of defects. And also, people developed the kind of experimental method to deterministically generate the vortices in our systems. Uh, it's, uh, but uh, the vortex shedding is very periodic. So once you know that the, the period very precisely, then you can, we can uh, control that the number of uh, shed vortex, number of vortices in that manner. But there's other, many other experimental methods to deterministically generate kind of uh, uh, vortices. Basically, uh, in cold atom community, there are so many experimental techniques to manipulate your wave functions there. So there's many other techniques out there, yes. Okay, questions? All right, well, if not, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. And we have